Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday Reads recorded on a Friday. Uh, I've read two books this week. Uh, Preparations for the Next Life by Atticus Lish and You Too Can Have a Body Like Mine by Alexandra Kleeman. So starting with, with the Lish and for two thirds of this book I was totally into it. And then a third character, main character is introduced about two, way, two thirds of the way through and it, it totally changes the, the, the tone and the pitch of this book in a way that, that, that sort of really made it drop off what my interest was in had been for the first two thirds. So the two main protagonists are Brad Skinner who is an Iraqi war vet with undiagnosed PTSD. I say und undiagnosed, it's pretty obvious but it's undiagnosed because then the military would have to pay him more money. Uh, and the other character is um, Zhu Li, who is an immigrant from China, uh, a paperless immigrant. Um, she, her mother was Uyghur, the persecuted Muslim uh, minority in China, and her father was, was, was Han Chinese, and was in the Chinese army, the People's Liberation Army, and was killed uh, on duty. Um, so Zuli makes her way all the way across the world to Mexico, then up over the border and up to New York, where she meets uh, Brad. And uh, they have uh, an affair or a relationship, whatever you want to call it. It's hard to say whether it's based in love. It's based, to me, it's based more in loneliness, that they're sort of thrown together or they, they, they find one another. Um, but there's a great gap at, at the heart of it. They're both quite self-involved, they're both quite broken, um, and they're sort of clinging on to each other for dear life, really. They are trying to help each other. They are trying to help themselves. I mean, Brad's obviously trying to deal with his depression, his alcoholism, uh, his sort of suppressed violence. She's trying to deal with the anxieties of that she could be shipped back to China if she's caught. And how can she make herself legal? Uh, legal, and you know they do take tentative steps to deal with these problems. But they're, you know, being human beings, they're they're sort of overwhelmed and they're stuck in their same patterns, and they don't really make much progress. Because the star of the first two thirds of this novel is not them and their relationship. They're, they're, there's the sort of hook. The star is New York City, and the various immigrant um, populations and the culture and the life and the ebullience. Which is brilliantly done here. I feel it's you know you not only get the sights, you get the sounds, you get the smells. It's just wonderfully conjured. I mean, so often, and a big complaint I have in novels is when descriptions of people, you know, when they're walking through a, a cityscape or whatever, you just get lists, lists of things. Whereas here, you get the full vibrancy. You, you know, you get the sense of these things almost appearing in front of you. But then, unfortunately, as I say, two thirds of the way through, another character is introduced. A character who's been hinted at. Where Brad is staying, he's he's renting off a land of a family, uh, and the landlady's son returns from prison, uh, and basically wants his old room back that that's been rented out to to Brad. And now we have character becomes much more centre stage violence which I'd been wondering about you know because New York like any modern city has its sort of underlying violence of crime of desperate people poor people people with mental issues um, all this sort of stuff and it wasn't really there and it's sort of introduced or that side of it is revealed with the introduction of this character and as I said it becomes much more sort of character led but not in a not in a great way I don't feel um, because the strength of the book hadn't, had been the whole, um, you know, the whole vista of a city and these two small people moving through it. Whereas now, you know, it's about their, their relationships. And I didn't really care enough about them, the characters, to really want to follow that story. And you knew where it was headed. I mean, one of the reasons I don't think 1984 is a great book by George Orwell is because... The power of the state is, is described by Orwell as so all-encompassing. You know, and spoiler alert, you know Winston and his lover are going to get caught because the, the, the state is all eyes and cannot be, you know, you can't hide from the state. And the inevitable ending to this is not dissimilar, I'm afraid. Um, so it went from being a really solid four stars to being sort of three star read for me. And on to Alexander Clemens, you two can have a body like mine. 
So very much in the envelope of writers like A.M. Holmes and uh, some, to some extent Atosha Moshveg and uh, Miranda July of recognisably our contemporary world but off kilter and the characters being off kilter. And again, this isn't really a book about the characters and about their relationships. It's about the world that it's describing. Uh, so the three main characters, there's character A, who's the protagonist, who is a young woman. There's character B, who is her roommate, uh, who so wants to be like her uh, that she changes her appearance to be like her, hence the title, because she believes that will make her more successful socially. And character C is character A's boyfriend. And the book opens with uh, a, a sort of discussion about how all of our internal organs have to do whatever it is they do, unseen, in the dark, unknown to us because we, you know, short of x-rays, we never see them at work. Um, and that's why human beings, therefore, concentrate on what they can see, which is the surface, which is their skin, which is why they, you know, and their appearance, and they want to look beautiful, and all, all this sort of stuff. So it starts off sort of really right up my street and we get a series of really oddball satirical things about society so for example there's a set of advert tv adverts which are brilliantly imagined for this sort of confectionery cake product uh, and the the logo character for this company is a cat who's always trying to eat to digest to eat one of these products and can never do it pop you know in some of the early ones you know either the cat is in cartoon form and the cake is in you know real photo you know film form or vice versa and the two realities can't meet uh, unlike uh, who framed roger rabbit um and increasingly this cat is sort of gaunt and drawn and you see it's ribs because it can never eat the product and that's the way the advertisers have have, have chosen to sort of make their product so sort of attractive. It's, a, it's an odd uh, uh, sort of dissonance. There's another product for a beauty pro another advert for a beauty product, which is quite sort of, when you read it, it's quite startling. There's a, 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 a phenomenon called uh, disappearing dads, where fathers of families suddenly disappear from their, their, you know, the bosom of their houses go missing and if they are ever sort of seen again they're in the you know towns over with a new family but it's not because they've been having an ongoing affair with the woman of the new family or whatever they have simply like amnesia forgotten of their their previous life woken up somewhere else uh, estranged and alienated and either they remain alone and, and befuddled, or they sort of start again within, you know, set up a new family. Um, and there's a, a cult, which is based around consumerism. And gradually, all of these these uh, these phenomena are sort of drawn together under the guise of this cult. There's a TV show which is a bit based on. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. if you know that that show where husbands and wives or in this case partners have to answer questions uh, about their um, their partner who comes back and says whether you know what their favorite such and such is and if they're right if, if they've said what their partner has said they would say then it's right so here you get a huge cash prize if you win but you have to spit up if you lose um, and the challenges get increasingly difficult as you go through the show ending up with a sort of a blindfold touch test where you're in a room with loads and loads of naked people only one of which is your partner and you you know you're blindfolded you can't speak so you have to do it by sort of groping their flesh it's it's pretty uncomfortable uh notion but well done and eventually uh a is sort of you know, see her partner C has 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 you know won't return her calls and she can't track him down. Even though she stalks him, and eventually she she joins the cult. And there, that I feel the book goes downhill. Um, it's a book based. It's a cult based on consumerism and sort of mini, middle management. I couldn't see that um, uh, that the cult members were asked to give up all their worldly goods. It's more of one of those sort of say they sort of business achievement cults. 
Um, but it was less engaging, less interesting. Um, and then it sort of dribbled to its, its conclusion. So I gave it three and a half stars to say, not for the relationships, not even for its satire of consumerism, of TV ads, of religion, of cults, of consumerism as a cult, of obsession with you know how one looks physically and all, all that sort of stuff. Not for that, that satirical sort of heavy handed hammer hits a hammer and anvil approach, but for the detail work, which I thought was really imaginative, really engaged my, my interest. So three and a half stars. So that's that's my reading for the week. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to read next. I may read Percival Everett's Telephone, which is one of his more recent uh, works. That will make my seventh Everett book, I think, after last year's The Wonderful, The Trees, and uh, I also read last year Percival Everett by Virgil Russell, which is as postmodern as that title makes it sound to be. So uh, that's all for this week. Thanks very much. Till next time.